Welcome to another episode of the Proper Ugandan Podcast with Kalun Jiseba and the Kate. Um, before we start, I have to just remind you guys the social media. If you find me on instagram or in order to find me on instagram just search at king underscore kalunji and on twitter is kalunji underscore and then of course the podcast um the instagram and the twitter handles for this podcast is at proper podcast p-r-o-p-a podcast so yeah so this is a special guest episode and the reason why this guest is special is because i'm meeting them for the first time So one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast is so that I can explore Ugandan identity and Ugandan culture. And exploring sometimes means getting to know the unknown. So this guest that I've got is someone that I don't know. So it's exciting. I'm going to be asking her some questions and she's going to be asking me some questions. Um, But what I do know about her as well is that she's got an incredible new podcast that she's launching. So we decided we'll come together as Ugandan um, powerhouse that we we are and just help each other out, launch these podcasts together. So the person I'm speaking to today is Natasha Evita. That's the name that I know. Is that the name that is written on your passport, your Ugandan passport is Natasha Evita? That's my name, no, I'm joking. (laughs) That is is one of my middle names. Okay. No, so um, I don't think people need to know what's on my passport. I mean, they can, but um, we keep that PG. They can know. <laughs> they can know my brand. Like Evita is actually my middle name. Like my okay. dad actually named me Evita after the classic. Like the musical. Sorry. Did you like the musical? Yeah, after the musical, "Don't Cry for Me," Argentina, and also okay. Evita the musical. So yeah. he he named me after that. So that's actually legit. Like I didn't just you know just. It didn't come out from nowhere. (laughs) You know what's funny? In in our household, whenever any of us, like, complains about something that is irrelevant or trivial, at least to me and my brother, I always say, don't cry for me, Argentina. And I think we took it from my mum because she loved that song. So Really? Yeah. Anytime my brother, or especially when my brother's crying about something irrelevant, I go, don't cry for me, Argentina. So... Yeah. See, we're just old school and no one can we're hate. No one could even hate on the name either. Avita exactly. is like immaculate. It's a, it's a great exactly. name. Yeah, it's a good name. Okay, interesting. So th- one of the questions or the question that I like to ask my guests um, before we start is, when was the first time or the last time that you felt like a proper Ugandan? Um, like two, second, two seconds ago? <laughs> I feel Ugandan all the time. I feel Ugandan oh, yeah. all, to, all the time. Like, for me, it's not a separate entity to be Ugandan mm. and then to be non-Ugandan. I mean, mm. I mean, I live in a Ugandan household. You know, in, in, in my household, it's Uganda. And then, mm. you know, once you leave, obviously, you get a bit of London, England, all of that. But yeah, yeah. I think for me, I'm constantly around Ugandans. My family friends are Ugandans. My girls are Ugandans. Like... Mm. My social, my social circles, like everything, I'm, I'm proper self-aware of who I have around me, because yeah. I need to be intertwined and mixed in that, in that, in that sector. Just, j- just because I feel like if I'm not, mm. then I don't want to lose that piece of me, that identity, which I probably will never. But I just feel like it's embedded, just ingrained in me. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would. That's pretty long-winded, but yeah. No, that's a good. That's a good answer to that. Like. Have you always felt this way? Like, is that how you, you've always moved? Like, just always it like a recent thing? No. Um, I think when I was younger, I, I was born and raised in London. Um, and then when we got to primary school, me, my brother and my older sister, we moved to Uganda to study. Oh, wow. And we, yeah, we moved. So for those non-Ugandan, P, I moved in P4. So P4 is the equivalent to what, year five here? 
Yeah, because yeah, you're like nine years old and they Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I Is moved that, I, Oh that's dope. Wow. Yeah. And then I moved, I did P four up to P seven mm. in um Tiber Junior School. So I moved there, I was there. And then I did my S1 in Uganda as well in um, a school oh, wow. called Serta High School, which is like the equivalent of Namugongo. So oh, the, I was there okay. from... Explain to us Serta and what you mean by equivalent Namugongo. I say Namugongo is like high, it's affluent, it's like it's a, it's a posh area. No, I would say like, well, according to the Ugandan communities, our Tatas and our mamas, they would say, oh, Namugongo is here, Namugongo is here. Like, you know how they value those top, top schools? Um, yeah, so yeah, I would yeah. say it's like mm-hmm. the same. But the thing is, is like Namugongo, it's like they became a chain. You see how you have like Burger King and they have all their franchises and their chains. That's basically mm. how Namugongo was. And then Serta mm. was like the umbrella, like the sister mm. of like Namugongo's franchise. So that's why I said was the equivalent to Namugongo because it wasn't Namugongo. Like Namugongo was just slightly ahead. Okay, I'm not going to lie to you. I have to be real. Like, you're probably the most Ugandan person I've had on here, apart from See? me. Like, um, Told ya. Simply because, <laughs> no, I know no shade to anyone else that's been before. All the other guests were, were pretty Ugandan. And like you said, just the simple fact that you're breathing and living as a Ugandan human being, you're Ugandan. But you've actually spent time in secondary school. In you in Uganda, right? You said yeah, and primary and secondary I, actually. Primary, I, I left. I left in P four, so I oh, never wow. got to finish. Yeah, I never got to see P seven, P five. You know, I guess P six as well, and I never got to see secondary school. So when you when you mention all these, um, I guess Namugongo. I know Namugongo the area, but I don't know yeah. like the secondary schools. I guess oh, so you like, don't even know the schools? I'm finna tell you about the, the schools. You gotta <laughs> tell me the schools because like. I felt like, I feel, on one hand, I feel like I, I had a lucky escape because I used to go to boarding school and I hated boarding school. I despised boarding school. I despised it, despised it so much. I, I, I um, concocted a plan to escape boarding school. No I way. Couldn't be, I couldn't be in this. I despised boarding school. So um, you got to tell us a bit about the school. So what? You say Seta High, I imagine, and then you got Namugongo High. So, like, yeah, what's, what's so, the British wait, by that? the way, just before we move on, so did you mm. make that, that plan that you concocted? Did you manage to escape? Because I feel like every kid I says do. that and they don't actually, no, 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 escape oh my anyway. god, you're staying at the school and getting those canes, like, you're not going anywhere. No, let me tell you something, yeah. I actually, oh man, I feel so bad, I feel so bad admitting this because. I don't think my mom knows this. I don't think the people that came to help me know this, but I'm going to say it, right? So when I was about eight, I went to an old boys' school, um, Kaboja. Mm-hmm. So you know Kaboja, yeah. right? And yeah. you know Kaboja can be hard, right? Yeah. Um, if it's the one I'm picking up, the old boys' school, that's like, because yeah, so my school, cousin, yeah, went to it. Yeah, it's old boys' school. It's like, it's a bit traditional in that it's a Catholic school. And um, it was the first time I came across a a Catholic, I guess, priest that spoke Luganda, like a white priest that spoke Luganda. We had a priest called Father Kato, and I'd never heard a white. I've never, I'd never seen a white man before, and I'd never seen a white man speak Luganda, and he could speak snippets of it. But I hated it so much because it it was a very colonial school in that they didn't want us to speak our tribal languages. It was so bad that they actually got prefects who they got, their main job was to follow the students around. And if they heard you speak your tribal language, they beat you. So the canes, we really got those canes. And it was so bad as well. You couldn't even cry in your tribal language. You had to cry in English. You couldn't go, ay, 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 ay. You, to, oh, ch- ch- ch-. you know what I mean? <laughs> so, nah, they, I, I, that's extra sauce I added that. But <laughs> you, did, you exaggerated a little bit. They did, they did used to be, kids for speaking their own language and mm. it was terrible like it was it was horrendous it was horrendous so I concocted a plan early one morning I woke up I said you know what I can't be in this school this is hell so I pretended to faint I no pretended, yeah, you I didn't pretend, I pretended to I just I got up it was early in the morning 
I got out of my bank bed, it's the top bank, and I'm sorry, mom, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, my aunties, I'm sorry, everyone that paid for me to go to the school, I apologize. But I think they knew. And I just got up, got out of the bed, and just collapsed on like some bedding on the floor. And everyone came running, they came running, like, oh my God, ay, 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 and then they took me to the... And you know they proper hype it up as well. If you're to they fake, like, the whole... yeah, yeah. Trust me, they hyped it up. And I was a tiny guy, I was, it was, I was only like eight years old, but I was, I was a really tiny guy. So they must have thought, oh no, and them days as well, I did used to get sick kind of a lot, like as a young, as a young kid. So they must have thought, oh no, it's one of these... He's, he's always sick, whatever. Let's get him. Let's get him to the matron's um, office. They took me there, and then the matron told her daughter to watch over me to make sure, see if I wake up. And I wanted to check who was in the room, so I opened one eye, and then she she saw me. And she's like, "Oh yeah, Azukse. He's woken up. He's woken up. He's woken up." <laughs> and I went, "Fuck!" <laughs> and I went back to sleep. And I went back to sleep. And then they took me to the hospital. And yeah, and then I guess after that, we just realized, you know what, maybe he just wasn't built for the school. So I ended up going to a- Wait, but did you get a day. punishment? That's the I didn't, I didn't get a punishment. They let no, you go? They let me go, they let me go. It was a terrible school. Like they used to beat you just for the sake of beating you. It was a No, I heard, school. and they used to yeah, starve yeah. you guys a lot. I'm, I heard that. that as well, I've heard, like Porsche and beans every day. I'd had enough of that. And my, these times my friends are in Kampala parents, the day school, Eating, eating rice and grounded nuts every day. Yeah, like, that was no. a luxury. That's a luxury. Exactly. But Kampala, exactly. the parents, was also um, quite strict because my little brother as well, before he went into Taiba, before I get round to the schools and stuff, before he went to Taiba, they like did a practice run on us to see if we'll be able to handle the schools in Uganda. So he actually went to Kampala parents with um, a few of um little our little cousins so he went there and for the day and i remember he was just like oh my god this is awful but he enjoyed it just because of the fact that he was with his boys and you know the rest of the family but he was like this is really bad like he didn't yeah. like it and and that was just day school yeah. but i think it was like for him it was a shock the early mornings the waking up the routine mm. the food i mean you, this is someone coming all the way from the uk you know, as they yeah. would say, UK, or you have Abulaya. So they're like, oh, yeah, this person yeah, yeah, just yeah. comes from London. Okay. So it's like, it's like, it was really crazy. But mm. in terms of the schools, um, now that I get into it, it's just that at the time, I didn't know which schools were. And Tiber, um, the, okay, there's a few schools. So Tiber Junior School and Tiber High School was basically like the franchise that I was telling you about. But obviously, they just had Tiber High, Tiber Junior School. And those were practically the international schools of Uganda. So, like, all the cool kids, like, the ones from the UK, the ones... And it literally could be kids from anywhere. Kenya, always East African kids. So, Kenya, Tanzania, they were always there. And then there'd be kids from, like... Yeah, we'd have kids from, like, Norway. Yeah, it made Mm. no sense. Germany. No way. Mixed race Mm. kids, like... Mm. white kids yeah like our school was just the place to be I guess Mm. and eventually like I think my mom wanted us to transition into a school that wasn't just too harsh at the beginning but Mm. it was something that we could slowly ease into and also she wanted us to still have that element of culture as well like obviously Uganda is cultured but she didn't want us to just be segregated and just be you know Uganda Uganda especially if these are the options there so Tiber, Tiber Junior was literally from P1 to P7, and then Tiber High was from S1 up to S6. Um, and then I think they even had Tiber College. I'm not even too sure, but I know a lot of my friends that I left in Uganda, a lot of them went to the Tibers, like the mm-hmm. whole chains and stuff. So mm. even when I meet up with them now, which is weird, they're all in London, they, mm. they all like have their own lingo and like, whatever they say from like Tiber College and I just don't get it anyway but I tried mm-hmm. to like mix in as much as possible mm-hmm. um then I think there was another school called Rainbow and Rainbow is literally um just before just before Tiber I think it's Kajansi that's where it okay. is okay. and that was like premium creme de la creme like the crop hey. like hey. before Tiber like it's mm. 
it's like you can be they had like americans there dessert. and if you heard about rainbow people say that that's the school like where kids are spoiled and all of this stuff like you'd hear the parents say this because they'd get up to like everything and do everything that's that's what people mm-hmm. would say anyway but my cousin as well also came from london and my uncle was living out here for um, in uganda for a very long time mm-hmm. and she is like a no nonsense type of girl she was like no nah, i'm not going to any of these uganda schools blah, blah, blah. so they put her in rainbow for a term she mm-hmm. didn't want to leave she didn't oh, want really? to leave yeah. yeah so clearly it is a good school like clearly mm-hmm. It's, it's a school which is like, you know, people love. And then you have the ones that are like just below like Rainbow, Tiber, and then you do have Kaboja. Not the boys' school, but you have like Kaboja oh, Secondary. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which is like, I don't know if you know about Kaboja, but it's like, it's actually close to where we live in Uganda, which is like near Busega, that side. And okay. from my understanding is... I'm not sure if you can, you can't, you can keep your hair. I'm not really too sure, but it's oh, yeah. not as strict mm. as the proper, proper boarding schools in Uganda. Mm. Like, yeah, that, it's that like, boarding school was yeah, a lot. it, was a it lot. is boarding, a lot. Trust me, like I, I only taste, Kampala parents was the only time I went to day school. And when you're telling me that, was it your cousin or your brother that went to Kampala parents? My was brother, it? just for a day, just for brother. a day. Yeah, just for, just just for, for a day, day, just for a right? day. But um, even then he thought it was intense. For me, that was like heaven because remember, I'm coming from, you know, the Holmes Darlings, the Kabojas, you know, so I'm coming from the boarding schools where it's like, it's tough. Whereas mm. he's coming from the UK, so the, the jump, the leap is a bit of a, it's a, it's a mad one for him. But wow, do, what, do you know about Aga Khan? Yeah, okay, yeah, then there was Aga Khan. Because I have a big family, so my uncle, t- he takes his kids to Aga Khan as well. Um, Aga Khan, you can keep your hair, right? I think. I think so. I think so because I had some cousins who were there as well, and I remember that. Yeah, I think so. But it depends on the family in it because are you saying the girls can keep their hair or the boys? I think the girls can keep their hair. Yeah, because every, sure. every school that I went to, the girls cut their hair, um, cut their hair. But also, actually, yeah, Aga Khan had a cousin, two cousins, um, girl cousins. So yeah, they had their hair. I think they keep their hair there. Mm. I'm yeah. pretty sure I got, but they've also got recently because the youngest of my cousins, like in that group, she, I think she's only like nine, ten, but mm. they've got a lot more relaxed with their rules in Aga Khan for that I know. But everyone that can't remember Aga Khan or is like familiar with it, it just remember it's just the, the school that had loads of Asian kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's everyone remembers, like all the Indian kids mm. or all the Asian I mean, kids or Kenyans. Called Aga Khan, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so everyone would just go to Aga Khan and then mm. that would be it. So then you would just know that that is that school. And then they had a secondary school, I think. Yeah, so that's all I know. Yeah. Mm. So I think those are pretty. Oh, and the other one was Gayaza as well. Gayaza was like one. borderline state school, mm. secondary school. Like mm. the only difference is you could have your hair. Mm-hmm. that's that's you all see, i know you see with the the whole hair situation because i do remember this actually the girls had to cut their hair and also we had to cut our hair as well w- why do you think that that was was that was that just because they wanted like people not to spend too much time doing their hair to keep everyone uniform or do you think there's there's something a bit more to it than that you know what, like, I've never really asked myself that question or actually reflected and thought about it, but I would assume that it's mainly so that the girls don't spend too much time with their hair because that's what our matrons used to say to us when we were being slow or just doing anything with our hair, like, you know, you're wasting too much time with it, maybe you should get rid of it, stuff like that. But now that I think deeply into it, maybe it was a sense of, like, they didn't want the girls to be, like, attracting the guys or... You know how Ugandans like think sometimes, like everything is a taboo. Like it's <laughs> just be like, so yeah, maybe I don't know. Maybe it was that. Yeah, because when I when I reflect on that, I think it's kind of interesting. It reminds me of this play that actually recently one of the actresses posted on her Instagram, and she reminded me of it. It's one of the best plays I ever saw. It's called uh, "The House That Will Not Stand" by um, Marcus Gardley. And um, it's set in New Orleans, and it's about this family of, I guess, what they refer to as mulattoes, um, who are like, I guess, mixed race people. Um, and um, the mother 
is like a, she's a mother hen, she's a matriarch. And there's a scene where there's this, um, one of her daughters has this big, big hair. And as part of the punishment of her, I guess, getting too full of herself, she gets her and puts her on the floor and gets some scissors and starts cutting her hair, cutting her hair, say, oh, you think you're old out with all your hair? Da -da -da, starts cutting her hair. And actually the whole cutting of the hair in school, even though I, I see why they did it again, you cut time, you wake up, boom, brush your hair and go. There is something really strange about, you know, curtailing the, the, the African body, you know, even, even like the, the fact that we couldn't speak a language, you know, so you can't speak a language, you've got to speak English. You've got to cut your hair because they feel like it's going to take ages and you're going to waste time. But then you think, well, how do other people who are in boarding schools where they have long hair, how much time do they spend? Mm, do they, don't don't they just wake up earlier? You know, are you telling me every single kid who's in boarding school in the rest of the world outside of Uganda is, has short hair? You know, I, I mean, I, I'm sure even people in the army get to ke keep their hair. Women get to keep their hair, surely. You yeah, know? they do. But if you notice yeah. in the army, like the women's hair is like a, only a specific type of hairstyle. It's either tied mm. into like a bun like mine at the moment, or it would just mm. be like, yeah, just slick back in a way where mm. it's away from the face, a way where it's mm. like entirely neat. I've mm. never seen someone that works in the army or police and they have their hair all the way down or like oh yeah yeah out. of course yeah that, um, that wouldn't be feasible for them as well would it it's yeah dangerous. yeah but I do see people with you know with dread I think they made it illegal for them I could be wrong but they made it legal for them to discriminate against someone if they have like dreadlocks for example because that's the thing especially it was it's a thing here in the UK but also in the US like they were discriminating people from um joining the army because they've got locks so they mm. leave their jobs because they've got locks and reason i know a little bit about this is because i'm writing a play about that um about oh, like dope. Hair in the, yeah writing a play about hair in the black community so you know i think they, they made it they made it so that you can't discriminate uh, at least in the states that you can't discriminate or certain areas in the states you can't discriminate against black women for having locks and stuff like that so i just remember in uganda like they, it, it's a bit it's a bit weird that you go there to cut your hair you know I, you know I even have like um, an uncle who didn't want his you know he, one of his nephews to have like dreadlocks so much so that when he went to meet him to see him he cut his hair off. like he cut all of his hair off oh, so he nice. meet him. yeah because he didn't want he hated locks so much and I, I I also felt like palpitations when I went to Uganda for the first time by myself. Because I went there with locks and I went to see my aunt and, you know, and immediately they were all kind of looking at me like, oh, oh now, like, this person is a, you know, is a rugger now. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's how they you know, see you as well, yeah. yeah. like, they think you're a gangster, you know, even my little cousins are saying, oh, wow, like, you've got locks, does that mean you're a gangster and stuff like that? They go, not really, that's not really the case because gangsters can also have regular hair, so-called mm. regular hair, do you know what I mean? So it's, and it's sad because it's up for it's up to you to teach them that this is actually mm, a look like this is exactly. the trend in the UK right now like mm. a lot of guys that you see especially black men they all have like you know the small little dreadlocks or the dreads mm. or they're, they're trying to grow locks and stuff because I think it's like it's it's the style it's the fashion but also it's like more accepting at the moment so it people is, yeah. some of them is like they're not only following trend but I just feel like guys are also trying to experiment with their hair and say mm. oh we're in this new dynamic like where we can grow our hair out like let's try and see it doesn't work for everyone mm. but <laughs> <laughs> let's just to say everyone. let's just say yeah. that but you do you and um yeah. yeah explore and experiment i guess exactly yeah exactly and i just find it weird that kind of like with things that black people do naturally at least it, 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 in, in the rest of the world as well but like in the ugandan context people start kind of um, associating it with being a, a gangster or you smoke weed or whatever. Like, literally, mm. one, of, one of my cousins, and they're young, of course, that, you know, it's, I guess they're just repeating what they hear. But they just assume that, oh, yeah, it must mean you're a gangster or whatever, you do bad stuff because you got, you got locks. And it's unfortunate it's not true, you know, because, like, that, that, that can't be true. That can't be true because you see people with short hair that commit crimes that do bad things you know but wearing locks and having big hair or so-called unkept hair has been kind of 
demonized and vilified and you know and people literally look at someone and go well that person looks like a thug like they've got their hair like that especially in uganda like even walking you know around the um the market you know mm. like the Kampala, like in the taxi rank the way that people get your attention and that's why when i went there this time around i was like oh, I, can't, I can't i just it just gets too much attention so i i, I went for this style instead but the way to get your attention when you got locks is say, hey, Rasta, Rasta, don't want them. Rasta, <laughs> come, come. <laughs> no behaviour, like no filter. You can't do that in the UK. You can't just call someone a Rasta. Yeah, you couldn't. But it's just like, yeah, Rasta, don't want Come, 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 come. And you stand out to such a, an extent where it's a bit annoying. So you go, you know what? Let me just, let me just fit in slightly for this amount of time, which is a shame mm. that we have to do that. But at least let me yeah. do that just so I can survive these two weeks. Yeah. Next time you should be like, yes, I'm a Rasta. Like when exactly. they're yeah, to yeah. You. I'm gonna yeah. do that next time. And then yeah. they're they're just gonna be happy. So just do that. Mm. So are you in Uganda now, or are you in the UK? No, I'm in London. Um, okay. so fast forward, did my S one, came back. So I spent 2004 to 2007 in Uganda. Then came back end of 2007, and yeah, just did like I had to. They then put me back a year because oh, okay. yeah like all my english because i had to sit all these exams again and everything else was okay but my maths was just like basic mm. like because i was like what is this english maths i don't get it like, <laughs> <laughs> i just don't what? get it we say <laughs> english math ugandan math two plus two equals five it's, is that what you say it's like so different <laughs> no it's just like you have to overthink with ugandan mathematics here you it's mm. like you don't have to overthink it is what it is and you don't think that so you're always just trying to do extra calculations but really you don't need to do that so mm. anyway I got back a year and um I did year eight up to and then I went to a private school uh, all girls private school here then I did mm. I think year eight um so I won scholarship to mm. to do like to be in the private school but then unfortunately my mum was just like she's having an international job so she was traveling back and forth and mm. um she was just like this school is also too much and da, 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 da. i mean private school's nice if you've got money i'll tell you that because yeah, yeah, yeah. i was learning languages that i thought you know i was learning latin you mm. know it wasn't yet like yeah it wasn't just spanish and the common french and yeah it's mm. nice mm. if you've got money and you're in that sector their friends are like very you know posh and bougie so you just have to kind of be on that on that same wavelength but mm. after year eight my mum was like I'm gonna put you in another boarding school so we went to a boarding school but not in Uganda here in England oh, so okay. we went to a boarding school from I went to boarding school from year nine no year eight so I mm. like did the second term of year eight in that boarding school in Lincolnshire and yeah, yeah. I was there from year eight up until year 11 so wow. I actually did my GCSEs there as well so that was a whole nother different boarding school experience in comparison mm. to boarding school in Uganda. Um, yeah. Very what was interesting. It like? mm, what was it like? It was definitely like how I categorise, like, remember Rainbow in Uganda? I think it was like here in the, in the UK. The only difference is in the UK, there's more social pressure to have friends, to, to like stand out from the crowds, I would say, um, things like that. But there's just so much like openness and freedom and I mean I made so many friends that I was like at people's houses like every other weekend mm -hmm. you know staying there because I didn't want to stay in the boarding house or the boarding school yeah, yeah. like you mm -hmm. know it's different but then also you also make friends within the boarding school as well like so we had international students like students from China Nigeria like just Germany Poland like you name it like all countries mm. in that boarding school mm. and it's because all these different types of parents either are they just their jobs are very demanding they're traveling back and forth so the best thing that they want to do is put their kids in these type of schools which is what they yeah. did and you find that you build a community like a brotherhood sisterhood like it's, it's dope I would say and I think with Uganda you miss that because it's just like you know, do your homework, do that, mm, mm, mop the mm. floors, do your chores, like you're like a robot, like, <laughs> like constantly. A house girl. Yeah, 24-7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Then you have morning prep at like 4 a.m. Then you have to mm. wake up, you do your prep, then you come back, do your chores. It's like, uh, like it's just very like rigid. It's a very yeah. rigid structure. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not to, not to say that down here in the boarding schools over here, not like that, because you need structure as students, as kids in general. But mm. 
there's more openness, there's more freedom, there's more curricular activities, more for the person or the students to understand. You know, yeah, so yeah. it's that it's that version. Whereas Uganda, it's not about you. It's about mm. you have to study. We don't care about you like that. If yeah, that yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. It do, so, yeah. No, no, no. It does. It does. That's exactly how I felt. Listen, man. My my experience in boarding school was not was not the best. But you know, it was. I guess it did make me strong enough to survive a state school in London. Because when I came to London, and I was experiencing the mad stuff that that happens in state schools, you know bullying of course not to say that mm. i survived it but you know bullying or again people feeling that they need to fit in whatever i didn't really majorly fall victim to that and actually it was to my detriment slightly because i think people expected me to play a particular role as as a freshie for example, mm, for example yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. Because, because you know come, i came i came to london when i was 10 so you know, I only did one year in primary school here, and then I was straight into secondary school. So there was expectations of me as fresh off the boat, how I should, you know, um, uh, I guess I should understand the hierarchy, you know, the the social the social ladder where yeah. I was. And I didn't really, I, I didn't really go for that because first of all, like I mentioned, I went to a decent school in Kaboja, even though I didn't like it. Went to a decent school in Kampala Parents. You know, my parents were here in London, so they were able to afford for us to have, for me to have a decent life in Uganda. So coming come here, here, I didn't fit the stereotype of like, oh, you're fresh, you've never seen this, you've never done that, you had no shoes, you didn't do that, you had flies in your face. I didn't really have that. And that stereotype didn't fit the way I saw myself. So that came in, 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 in conflict with the, the other students, you know, black and white, who expected me to be a particular way. And that meant, you know, the, the occasional fights, occasional arguments. But, you know, even the teachers as well. I think the teachers were always surprised that I knew more than they expected me to, you know. So much, I was, I was speaking to my brother, I was like, they put me in the wrong class because they expected me to not know the things I knew, you know. Mm. Because, like you said, in Uganda, they push you to go study, 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 study. So you end up studying stuff that is a little bit ahead of the stuff that the kids your age in, in the UK will study. You know, I skipped a class in Uganda. So you come here and they're like, oh, how do you know that? And they feel some type of way or they, or they kind of like perceive your, I guess, intelligence or your early intelligence as you trying to be disrespectful or they try to pull you down a peg or two. So it affects, affects your study slightly, you know, but you know, Uganda, Ugandan boarding school, yeah, set me up for, um, to be able to survive London state school yeah it's true and even when you feel like sometimes even my brother says it to me all the time is like even when you feel like you're like trapped or you're mentally not okay in London or in general it's just like remember what you went through in Uganda it's just like yeah. remember Uganda and you're like oh okay okay it could be worse it could be worse yeah. like honestly it yeah. actually could be worse yeah 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 no like we we we're actually lucky when you think about it when you put that into perspective we are lucky to have you know for example you said you went to a really nice boarding school you know nice private school and there are some kids you know who don't, don't didn't get that in uganda they didn't get mm. i guess you know parents who cared for their education you know they i remember my dad would always say listen my dad had my dad or my grand granddad in this case you know he he had 20 plus kids so if you don't want to go to school that's on you like he he's not going to fret over you because he's got other kids he's got to worry about. So you had to show interest in your education. So he really like drove that home. Like, listen, you have to care about your education because at the end of the day, it's you're the one benefiting. I I don't benefit from that. Speaking of education, you mentioned something earlier because I think some people don't notice that you speak Luganda, I speak Luganda as well. So sometimes mm. you dip it into Luganda. You said yeah. so maybe travel. Can you tell people what so maybe travel means? So they Oh, uh, that just means yeah. read your books. <laughs> read your I books, think. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read your books. Like it also kind of it's like different connotations. Cause I feel like sometimes it means face your front and study. Like oh, oh, yeah. Because yeah. oh. you know when they're like it literally doesn't mean that, but they literally mean like mind your business, face your mm. front, study, mm -hmm. read your books, mm -hmm. like yeah, but I like to test the waters of Ugandans as well. Like, I don't like to say, oh, I speak Uganda. I'll just dip in yeah. Uganda there. And then yeah, if yeah, someone yeah. responds, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, then this yeah. is cool. This is wavy. Like, they can speak Uganda, so it's easy. Yeah. 
No, 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 of course. Like, and it's good as well when you're in Uganda and people don't think you can speak Ugandan. They start talking about you. Has that happened yeah, to you? Yeah, I mean, you can hear. <laughs> yeah, all the time, especially me. Oh, no, the this yeah. light skin girl over here, she's not Ugandan, this and that. I've mm-hmm. had it all. Mm-hmm. And I just laugh yeah. and I'm like, but I can speak it. I can fully speak yeah. it. Um, and I'm not only a Muganda as well, I'm a, I'm a Musoga oh. as well. So my dad's, oh. I, yeah. So my oh. mum is a Muganda, my dad's a Musoga. I can't actually speak Musoga, but I can understand mm. it. Like, I, I, yeah, I can yeah, understand yeah. Like, what they're saying and stuff. Mm. So. Mm. I've had the best of both worlds, to be honest. Like, on yeah, both you sides. have, because because actually the Basoga, there's similarities in 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 the language sometimes as well. Cause yeah, they. I just feel like they overextend words, or they'll mm. just play around with some of the nouns and take them out, put them back in. Put them but back you, in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, but you can even in Uganda, you can. I think it was easier for me to understand it a little bit, just because even as a Uganda, mm. you do know. If you hear as I'm going to what they're saying, you kind of yeah. sometimes can understand what they're saying. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, it's true. It's true because, uh, yeah, I there's a Musoga um, musician called uh, General Mega D, um, yeah. and he 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 had that song. You probably know this. Uh, am I still? You know, he's like, uh, I think the, I don't know the, the, the song goes. Hey, no one from am I still? And I just remember listening to that going. I thought this guy was. Uganda, like yeah, they all like even um, yeah. I heard, but you know, Chameleon can speak like loads of different languages. Yeah, yeah, they he said that he that. speaks Swahili. Yeah. He always speaks mm. Soga. He speaks like loads of different languages as well. And sometimes, mm. even when you hear him like singing, mm. he's not always just singing Uganda. Like he's yeah. switching up all the lyrics in there, and you're like, oh my gosh, like I can't even. My brain can't even take this. Mm. Like it's a lot, but no, it's actually so- it's quite admirable because you look at it and yeah. you're like, wow, oh, he's super talented. Yeah, 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 super yeah. Super talented, yeah. No, it's good. I love it when they do that, man, because it's a nice way of bringing all of us in Uganda together. Mm. And, um, you know, and you realise how, I guess, Buganda-centric Uganda is. You know what I mean? Because, again, immediately I just assume, you know, if someone's Ugandan and I see, I, if I don't see their name or whatever, I just assume, oh, you're in Uganda or you speak Uganda. But yeah, you see like, that assumption. Yeah. Immediately, yeah. immediately, yeah. I just go, yeah, you must be a Muganda when it's so dumb. No, mm, obviously, there's yeah. other tribes there, yeah. It's so true, and like, especially the ones in London, yeah, because I was so used to being around Mugandas, my family, or just growing up in Uganda, majority of people are Mugandas anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, so when I came here, you just, there's also a large portion of people you just think that are Muganda, but no. Yeah, the yeah, Ugandan yeah. community in London, there are people from the north, like yeah, yeah. people from Western Uganda, like I'm talking about like Abates, or like different yeah. tribes, like there's yeah, like yeah, yeah. not everyone's Baganda, so don't just assume like people understand mm. like my close friend as well, she don't understand Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. But language. then the parents can speak so many different tribes and languages, like it's just crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there you go. No, it's good. It's a lesson. It's a lesson for myself, but it's a lesson for everyone out there. But um, let's take a mini tiny break to remind people that this episode of the Proper Ugandan Podcast is sponsored by Kalun Gem. Kalun Gem is my clothing line that I started. I started it because I wanted to just remind myself that to be Ugandan royalty, to be regal, to have that natural regality, you have to be above cool. So when anyone gives you that wahala, that wasi wasi, that nonsense, just kalunjem, you know, just be above cool. So you can find us on Instagram if you just search kalunjem, K-A-L-U-N-G-E-M, clothing. That's the Twitter, uh, the Instagram handle. And, uh, and you get be able to get a, uh, a link to the website where you can uh, buy yourself a nice array of um, T-shirts, a sweatshirt and a snapback as well so check that out or if you'd rather and you're not on instagram check out my website kalunji.co.uk and you'll be able to get a link to the clothing store all right boom let's get back we're learning so much here actually like i'm so i'm so nice, glad little, we, um, nice little plug there love it i nice love it plug. listen i i try and learn from like those podcast um veterans Mm-hmm. So like, they, they get they get sponsors in it so they get yeah. sponsors but i thought i might as well sponsor myself you know what i mean love that yeah so um, that's the kind of king power that we need 100 percent, exactly so yeah so speaking of like you're you know plugging yourself part of the reason why i wanted to talk to you is because you jumped in the proper podcast instagram 
DM mm -hmm. and you plugged your podcast. Um, you called yeah. Talks with Fesh, right? Yeah. That's coming up. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, actually, instead of just going, yeah, yeah, I'll check it out, I thought, why don't we cross promote, you know? So mm. I wanted you back and said, let's, you come on my podcast, I'll come on yours. So tell us a little bit about your podcast and why you started it and when it launches as well. Okay, so Talks with Tash um, is a podcast about um, taking up space within our community. Um, it's definitely a conversational podcast, but it's a mixture. It's going to be having interviews, conversations, you know, different styles, you know, within a podcast. Um, and it's all about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable topics in society. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about we're ripping off those old band-aids. Just, you know, giving you a little taste, like we're talking family trauma, we're talking about microaggressions within the workplace, but we're also, you know, talking about topics that are not too heavy, topics we can laugh about as well. Yeah, like COVID, like how we've been, you know, spending time in quarantine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, stay out for Talks with Tash, guys, stay tuned. Um, yeah. We'll be launching in July very latest um mm. and just make sure you download all the episodes subscribe tell me what you love about them you're going to absolutely laugh some mm. of them some of the guests that we have on oh my days you just yeah you can be left on the edge of your seat constantly and how, so, how can we find you so so on instagram is talks of tash pod on twitter is talks of tash pod as well um and then my personal instagram is natasha Ravita. personal twitter is tasha Ravita. Yeah, and not even on Facebook, Talks with Tash. Talks with Tash pod. Brilliant. What made you want to start that podcast? Um, so it's interesting. Loads of people would say to me, like, I'm really good at debating. I'm really good at, like, talking with people, like, turning the conversation and stuff. And I love a chat. I can, I can chat for ages. Like, <laughs> even when I'm on the phone to someone... It just gets deep too quick. And sometimes my friend is like, Tash, you're too deep, like my head. Like, I'm like, like I just can't help it. Like, you know, if I speak to someone on the phone or I want to speak to someone, you know, it's all about valuing each other's time and adding some depth and growth to that person. So I always feel like it's always just be just good to have a listening ear and to talk to people. And yeah, and it's something that we don't do that much. I feel like we're in such a social society where it's just like you whatsapp someone you just i message them you can dm them on like insta or twitter so when i separate those things and i speak to my real friends like you know my friends my family you know and I have those conversations there's always so much you can learn from them so then my friends were just saying like oh my gosh you could start a podcast Tash. you could start a podcast and i would be like don't be silly like this is just this is just you know normal chat like normal debates even when people come around just normal chat and then eventually it started to just drill into my head and I was just like but what if we did because all these conversations and emotions that we're talking about this could actually help someone you know we could all learn together we could all grow together and I think within my in industry because I'm a social I work as a social media editor um, and it's all like to do with creatives and stuff but before then I'm in multimedia journalism anyway, and you meet so many different people from all different walks of life. I mean, as creatives, you meet photographers, filmmakers, animators, illustrators. Oh, the list is like endless. And even broadcast journalism, you meet radio presenters, a lot of people. So every time you talk to such people, I always just kind of humble myself and say, what can you take from these type of people every time you meet someone? Mm. and it something always resonates with me and it's just weird I can meet someone for the first time and just have you know a very long chat with them and I think if God has given me that purpose in life you know mm. that vision that you know mm. that that's 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 my calling why yeah. am I just going to sit on my talent you know there's yeah. so many of us sitting on our talents and obviously there's fear and you know different things like that you know resources mm. money but there's always something out there so I just mm. thought I just thought, why didn't I do it? And the thing is, I went to Uganda in December, came back in end of December. Then I was there for like January that time, came back. And then it was still like, you know, on my mind, playing on my mind. And you know, when, when you're, as a creative, when you get a concept and it's playing on your mind and you still get that fire in your belly. Yeah. It's like, just do it, just do it. Mm -hmm. So I was yeah, like, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. So the more I started talking to people about it, I didn't tell people at first I was starting a podcast. I just have conversations like, what type of things do you listen to? What do you write, read? Da, da, da. And the more you speak to the people, there's always a niche and a market for something that you have 
I believe. Absolutely, like, yeah. so yeah. many people, even if you think it's just one person, it doesn't matter. Like, eventually mm. things will grow. And I then started to take notes, you know. I was like planning, I, I had a notebook, a brand new notebook, mm. and I was already writing content from like January in Uganda, mm. February. Oh, I was wow. writing podcast content. Like, I've got content for like six to a year, six, six months to a year now. Oh. I've just been writing, 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 and then eventually mm. I was just like, at first I was like, should I call it even Talks of Tash? Because I feel like that, that's so vain. That's the vanity all mm. over. And then mm. I was like, but no, because it's, it's, it's my podcast. It's a thing that, you know, it's different. It's not, I'm, I'm obviously I'm providing you a service, but a more personal experience, more personal service. And mm. obviously I want people to know that this is Tash. I also want them to, you know, get to know me, learn with me, you know, mm. It's not just about them, but we're learning and growing together. You know, they're not on their, yeah. they're on their own. I'm also yeah. with them on this journey. And let's mm. grow, learn and heal together and understand things from a better perspective. Rather mm. than just, oh, this is happening. Okay, this is happening. We can talk about it, but what are we going to do about it? So I thought Absolutely, like, yeah. let's just just make it Talks of Tash. That was it yeah. really. No, it's good. It, it does what it says in the tin, isn't it? Yeah. So to Tash, it's good. I like those kind of um I guess branding, that kind of branding where you just know exactly what you're getting. You're you're a really compelling speaker actually. So um yeah, I think your podcast is gonna be really good. You draw the your your listener in, you know. So yeah, so I really look forward to it. I think it's gonna be Oh, very, thank very you. Important. I'm flattered, I'm flattered, honestly. Yeah. Um yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited. Um, mm. you know, like I even just like reaching out to you and seeing what you were doing. Like I said, I'm humble. I'm just coming on here. I'm just trying to see what everyone else is doing. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to learn. So I was like, yeah, why not? Like as soon as an opportunity comes, especially now during lockdown, because you just don't know. Like I could be, I'm working from home currently. I have been since like for three months now. And eventually I might not be able to record as much. I might just be able to obviously just record once a week. But now I'm getting in three, four episodes a week in, Mm -hmm. you know? I think that's important. So I could just be putting out content for months to come. So I think it's yeah. important to be yeah, yeah. on, you know, to be doing stuff like this. And also learning like the proper Uganda podcast. Like I I love being Uganda. I want to talk about it. I want to learn mm. about it. I want to <laughs> laugh about it. I think it's something that's so interesting. And yeah. And the thing is, don't you think like everyone's jumping on like oh back in the day in London, it would be like only two things. I'm Jamaican or Nigerian. <laughs> People yeah. know about us now, but yeah. we've been out here for a long yeah. time. You just yeah. weren't interested in us. But 100%. now we're very vocal. We're doing our thing. Everyone's like, oh, Ugandan sister. No, we've been here. Yeah. You know, no, same I as remember. the Congolese have been here. Same as, you know, air trains. The people, we've all been here. Like, because yeah. you would say, oh, Africa. And people would just be like, Nigeria. No, there's, oh, they don't even get my blood. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's I, so I, many I countries in Africa. I remember them days, man. Like I think first time, first time I was telling people I was Ugandan, they immediately just heard Ghana, you know. So that was another See? one where it's like it's Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica, you know. Like yeah, it's so good, and you know, love to all them other, you know, African or Caribbean countries. But it's so good to be able to like reach out to fellow Ugandans because unlike you, I haven't had that kind of connection with Uganda for mm-hmm. for a long time, at least in London, you know, because I always took it for granted because I was like, I was born in Uganda. Man, I, I know about Uganda. I occasionally say good morning to my mum in Uganda. I don't need to practice my Uganda. And then you try to string a sentence together, you know, to your judge and like, she's looking at you like, listen, bro, just like speak English. I, I might understand you more speaking English than if you spoke Uganda to me. So just stop. So, so yeah, so this is great opportunity for us, especially with this, my podcast but also with yours where it's an opportunity to reach out to fellow creatives and with my ones like-minded Ugandans and we can just like really just get to know each other and how we can help each other because the really good it's unfortunate that it's happening under these circumstances but one of the good things about Black Lives Matter um, gaining so much traction is that a lot of us black people have realized, oh, there's value in yeah. ourselves and value in other black people. So whereas before we might have been chasing opportunities from Arazungu, 
we're going, ah, actually, maybe I can get my fellow Ugandan to help me with this. Maybe, you know, I, maybe I can get a, 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 a Nigerian to help me with that or a Congolese to help me with this because we are all, if I can do this, that means another Ugandan can do that. So let me get in touch with them. And it's been, it's been really, really, really good because I've come across so many talented, you know, Africans and talented black people that I think, ashamedly enough, before I probably would have just like ignored and just went, oh, let me just chase the white train, you know, let me just chase that because that's mm. the mainstream, you know, and we and it does get ingrained in, 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 into our minds growing up that Ugandans are not capable of doing anything, they're gonna steal from you, you know, don't trust the Uganda, don't trust this person from this tribe, don't trust this person from that part of Africa, and we. Again, you know, I'm um, internalized that. And when we get older, we don't know this, but we end up actually subconsciously, yeah. you know, um, I guess projecting that onto other black people and going, oh, I don't think I want to work with a Nigerian, you know, they might 419 me, or oh, I don't think I want to work with that person from that tribe in Uganda because I hear they do this. When actually, that's a colonial way of thinking. That's mm-hmm. definitely something that we've either been told by our, our I guess, elders who have internalized it via their colonization via the colonization of the white man so the white man told them don't trust that person right there you are the best tribe okay so in fact let's call this country after your tribe okay you are the best mm. so that's what they've done to us and they've separated us and it's not good and now i think with the black lives matter movement we're all going ah, ah no that's not true i do trust my fellow my fellow ugandan i do trust this Muswaga, despite what you might say it doesn't matter i'm gonna work with them you know so yeah. it's good yeah that's true and what how yeah. do you what do you think about the black lives matter movement at the moment like what are your thoughts on it so far so you know i have to say that in 2016 i did go to the first black lives matter march in in, in the uk in london mm. and um i was there you know going black lives matter you know i was really fired up i made a speech right next to mandela's statue told people i mind blah power to the people you know and i felt moved and compelled to do so because again like many of us um, this time around, we saw a human being be shot on camera. So I'm yeah. going, wow, we got to do, we got to speak up, we got to stand up in solidarity with you know the African Americans whose culture we've benefited from for so long and still continue to do so. So let's not just like enjoy the good stuff. Let's also you know stand in solidarity with them. So I went and did so, and then we hoped at least four years later we wouldn't be in the same situation. And here we are again. We watched another human being be, being being killed. And then we you have other people that we hear in Brianna Taylor being killed, you know, you see Ahmad Aubrey being killed by the police and by white supremacists. And you're like, man, are we gonna have to go through the same thing again? Right. Are we gonna have to keep reminding people again that our lives matter? Like that's the thing that's really frustrating about us having to repeat that phrase because we me and you know, you know, of course there's those always gonna be anomalies, but me and you know that black lives do matter. We know that every day. But having to remind or even tell people who've never considered this that our lives matter, it is exhausting. And I love the fact that that movement has actually, you know, spurred a lot of people to from different industries to go, oh, you treated me like shit when I was working here. You need to stop that. You don't yeah. hire enough black people, so you need to stop that. But I love it for that. The unfortunate thing that I don't want to be a pessimist, but I just... I, I, I feel like we're gonna we might be here four years from now. Even though it feels different, even though, you know, white people are on the wave, you know, other nationalities and ethnicities are on the wave, which is different to last time around because people were in the shadows. It wasn't cool to be Black Lives Matter people. Yeah, working, no, that's true. You know, so it's a bit different now. Um, so maybe we won't be here four years time and people are doing things, loads of stuff you know, are are happening in the States, in the UK here, and hopefully in other parts in Europe, you know, and beyond as well, not just Europe, you know, Asia, Africa. So hopefully we won't be here where we're doing another march in four years' time when there's going to be an election in the States, you know? So, yeah, in answer to your question, I do do love, like, what everybody's doing, and I love that movement, but I just... I just hope that one day we don't need to say say that phrase. You know, I look for that day where we don't have to be forgiven that Black Lives Matter. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't. No, that is true. I don't, yeah, there's some things that are just a given. Like it's, it's human 
it's a human it will strain it will be strange to just say human lives matter like it just that doesn't even sound right because you just go yeah of course humans lives we deserve to be alive but we have to say that in order for people to appreciate that you know what, what are your thoughts what do you, you know think? and separate us from that uh separate us mm. i think for me because um I absolutely love it, but also I needed a mental health break from it. Like it was just yeah, too much. Yeah, yeah. You're going on social media, you were seeing it all, and it was just a lot. And you know, I was like hysterically crying when I saw that video of George Floyd. I think it was just too much for me to actually even see. And then uh, I'm just so inquisitive anyway. So I went on YouTube and looked at all the deaths, and, and you know, I was reading the statistics of all the people that have died, you know, in regards to like, you know, police brutality and social injustice so I was just like really really upset and it was just a lot and seeing your people come together and rise yes it's an amazing thing it's so admirable you're like no in fact it's not even admirable it should be the thing anyway it should be the thing mm. that we do mm. but at the same time in the same breath I was like oh, I'm actually tired like I'm actually tired I'm not tired for selfish reasons but I'm tired for us like I'm tired that we have to continuously go through these things not to mention you have people saying all lives matter we know all lives matter like we've been knowing all lives matter but for some reason black lives haven't mattered for a very long time mm. and also one thing that was making more emotional is like all these celebrities influencers or just people that i know in general are coming up speaking up and then sharing their stories as well of what they've been to been through it just goes to show every black person has experienced more than one element of racism in their life. Every black person. It's, and it's so, so sad. And like hair colors, like being segregated, like, oh, I couldn't even tell you. Like even thinking about it, it's like microaggressions at work. I've been through so many microaggressions at work and just even being, people being racist towards me and being bullied and stuff like that. And just for the color of your skin, mm. it's just ridiculous. And it's like something that it's not just London or the UK, US, USA, it's society. So when I'm kind of seeing it, I'm like, yeah, I'm happy. I'm also emotional. I'm sad. There's just a ball full of emotions when I see it. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, I hope you're not just doing it. Cause it's like, you know, I'm seeing some people just doing it, following and trend, like black lives matter, let's support this, support mm -hmm. that. And some of the people that I've known from like school days, like are even on my Instagram, my Facebook, but you were the very people being racist towards me even when I was in school. Mm. So keep the same energy when you're going Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And I'm seeing people have like now done their research and writing paragraphs and essays. And I'm like, but do you actually feel this way though? Because mm -hmm. you know, if you do, that's amazing. I'm glad that you're going there to educate because a lot of us are going to these protests and standing up for Black Lives Matter. That's all well and good, but it's all more deeper than that. It's all about educating. It's all about standing up for yourself. There's just so much more to it. Supporting Black businesses. Because another thing that was heavy on my heart was the fact that black people towards black people we need to do better to make black lives matter we don't support one another the same way that you know the english man may support someone we don't and this has been a massive wake-up call now I'm, it's like i'm happy i'm seeing black businesses and black people sharing other black businesses because this is something we've we've needed to do for a long time because if they see that we're not in unison how else are they going to think that they can you know support us so I think for me, that was like a massive pinnacle point. And I was super, super happy to see that other black people were supporting other black people more often and that we're coming mm. together. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And I do think there's change. If anything, for black people, there is change, you know, towards other black people. I'm just super happy about that. And it's just so sad. But it's just even made me realise, even when I'm at work, oh, I'm just like, oh, you lots are so racist. I, like, I can't stand you. Like, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. little things like that. But I'm like, am I just in my feelings? I'm overthinking it. But I'm mm. more aware now. Like, I'm seeing things more awarely. Mm. Like, I was aware, but now I'm, like, proper woke. Like, I see things. What, kind, like, of things, what kind of things are you seeing? Like, what happens at work? Like, you know... Even, it might not necessarily be me, but it might be, I might see my other black counterpart or like someone that's at work and they're, you know, they're not going into a meeting or they're like, you know, being told to work extra hours or they're being segregated or something silly like that. Like, and we know why, it's just because they're black. But then before in my head, I would like be in denial and kind of make up excuses that this stuff isn't happening only because one I didn't want to admit it but of course it's happening it's always happening it happens every day I see it all the time like 
mm-hmm. you know and also another thing for me which is really annoying is seeing all these companies now that are putting out campaigns like you know making profits off of this whole movement and black lives matter when realistically you should be checking on the black people that you work with yourself your black employees have you even asked them how they're doing today like ways you can support them before your you know i want them to support all these charities and these movements but start you know charity begins at home start from where you are now and i think this is something that they're not and like again as brands do they just follow the bandwagon and that's just something that I just hope that they don't continue to do and they can change that. You know, it's more yeah. than just, um, you know, yeah. someone taking the knee. Like, what are you taking the knee for, you know? Mm. Yeah, some of, these, some of these symbolic kind of gestures are easy to do because they don't require so much. You know, they don't require them having to fire that racist CEO or they don't ha- require them having to replace themselves with someone black so they can go, okay, took a knee i put the little black square on instagram or i got my daughter to do it so mm. that, that's enough right you know and you know it, i guess one of the reasons why um some white people are coming out the woodworks out the shadows and going black lives matter and i think someone wrote an article i think at the new yorker or maybe the new york post where they were asking why is it like why now why are they doing it now because you didn't do it back in the days this is what I'm saying. when i was working there or when i was in the when drama school with you why why now and I actually some of them said it's because it would seem kind of weird if they didn't whereas before it would seem weird if they did if they stepped out and, and said oh black lives matter right now it would seem weird and you're black friends as well as your wife friends to go hey karen you didn't say black lives matter why why didn't you say that so that's another reason why you know so many of the white counterparts are coming out of woodworks and going yeah black lives matter i believe that i believe that because then they don't have to answer the question why didn't you do it you know um but i wanted to ask this as well because someone asked me this um two days ago so spending time in uganda and then coming here, did you, did you ever, I guess maybe for you it's a bit different because you, you spent time in, in the UK first and then went to, to mm. Uganda, but did, was there a difference in, in your perception of your race and your identity when, when you're in Uganda as opposed to when you're in the UK? So in, in other words, did you, I guess, see yourself or view yourself differently as a black woman? in Uganda than you did in the UK? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And even when I was in Uganda, when I first went there, they make you feel like you're not, you like you can't be fully Ugandan because they're like, well, you've come from the UK first of all, so you have nothing, to, you don't know anything about Uganda probably. Mm. Um, so there's all these assumptions. So you, you already feel segregated, you know, you already feel like you don't belong or you're not a part of them. So I just felt like a black woman, a black Ugandan woman from London, but I never felt like I was Ugandan. Ugandan. Yeah. Mm, Until mm. I went to like towards the end of my primary school and I was like, nah, I've been here. Like I'm Ugandan. And the moment you wear it on your chest, say it proud, say it loud, like, and you stand up and you show that you're Ugandan, little things like eating the food, the culture, speaking more luganda like obviously if you can't speak luganda there's just so many different things that you can do like spending more time with your family you know um, going to all these cool different ugandan pop-ups that everyone's going to like at the time it was like garden city so everyone knew where garden city was mm-hmm. you know, just going to these yeah, places. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Just, those just those small little things to make you feel like you're fitting in you know and then when i came here i felt like a black woman a black Ugandan woman with all my Ugandan-ness that I'd come back with, mm. but I still felt like I didn't fit in in the UK mm. because I'd been gone for so long and I was so isolated from the world. And it was so different. Like, imagine you've left primary and you've come here. That's like four or five years. Nothing was the same, as Drake would say. <laughs> Nothing was the same. <laughs> like, you couldn't go on the landline and call your friend like, hey, you going to come out to play today? So I had to get mm-hmm. used to that because, one, your friends are not even there. They're probably at, like, raves, you mm-hmm. know, going to, like, colleges, cinemas, like, all those different mm-hmm. things. So, and then for a long time, you tell people about your experience with Uganda, they'd just be like, oh, like you said earlier, oh, you're fresh. 
you're just a freshie. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, so mm. you had to like tackle into that and understand it. And then for a very long time, I had resented being, you know, coming back from Uganda and being in this this bubble that it, it had put me in. Until after that, I was just like, you know, as they said, so many trouble. So I just faced mm-hmm. my front and started studying yeah, 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 yeah. and doing mm. that. And then eventually, all these things like friends, all of that stuff, it comes naturally. And mm. People want to get to know you anyway, especially if you know how much greatness that you can give to someone or how much of a great person that you are. So those Mm. things just naturally fall into place. And then it wasn't until like probably uni, after uni, there's just a whole Ugandan community out there. A lot of my friends from Uganda had actually come to London, which I was not. That's the thing as well. I lost contact with all these people. So I didn't have numbers, nothing, maybe like Facebook contacts afterwards. So when they came to London, I was like, no way, these people are in England? Mm. This is crazy. And then there was just so many Ugandan things, like, you know, like little things, like you're going to miss Uganda to watch the show or the pageant. You start, Mm. you know, bumping into your Ugandan, like people that you know or people that you went to school with. You feel more and more proud. And then it makes you want to kind of, you want to stop even interacting with your friends in the UK but you know your English friends or your friends in other different countries which is so bad to say but you just feel that acceptance that you've been longing for is finally there so you're just happy yeah 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 you feel more at home I'm not gonna lie to you when I speak to like you know Ugandans regardless what part of Uganda they're from that you just feel it you know you might not be besties or anything but you just feel like a sense of like being home you know that yeah i guess the ex- that having to explain yourself isn't as prevalent because you kind of there is the assumption i guess sometimes it can be b- bad but it can be um assumed familiarity where you're like oh yeah you know what i mean like for example you dropped some luganda and i like you didn't even have to ask oh do you speak luganda you just went boom you dropped it in there whether i caught it i caught it didn't matter yeah. you know yeah. whereas Whereas if, you know, you're talking to, I guess, your English friends and then Ugandan friends, you do have to kind of second guess how you express yourself because you're like, oh, they might not understand where I'm coming from, you know. And then it goes even deeper when you speak to non-black people because you're like, oh, you can understand the nuances of my experience. Oh, I'm going to have to cold switch in this way. Yeah. But actually speaking to, speaking to fellow Ugandans, you just feel like, hey, yeah, band ticket, I'm bored because... You know, yeah they, literally they know where i come from you yeah. know what i mean they they understand me you know yeah yeah literally first yeah. of all imagine that happiness that you feel anyway when you see black people in a, in another country you know when you go on mm-hmm. holiday like to yeah, Port- yeah. Or anywhere and you see black people you get so happy oh. they might not even be able to even speak english yeah but you just mm-hmm. see a black person and your heart mm-hmm. like skips a beat because you're like, oh, I just want to check and see if that person's okay. Like, are they okay? I want to yeah, say yeah. hi. I don't even know you. I just want to meet yeah. your family. But you don't know that person. You mm. could be a murderer for all you know. But you're just they like, could, yeah. you're just like, yeah. I just want to speak to that person. Now, let alone a Ugandan person. That's like, you know, of your heritage, heritage ethnicity. Mm. Like, it's just everything encompassed all in one. You're just mm. happy. You're yeah. just, and they might not necessarily have to speak Uganda, but. It's just little things that like you get the code, you know, you get how our parents react towards one another. Exactly. You get just yeah, little yeah. things. They just understand it. And you're just yeah. happy. Yeah, of course. Like I, I spoke to, um, I spoke to, we had a guest the other day. The, the episode's coming out soon, but um, he's, uh, his name is John Rothermack and he's from the North. So he's Luo, um, but he does speak Luganda. But I, I just immediately speaking to him it was like hey it's like speaking to my brother immediately like yeah the reason, the, i know it's it can be bad sometimes because you over familiarize yourself i guess and you might say something you shouldn't say but you go you go straight in the, the introduction yeah. of like oh so how was it like growing up you know with your grandparents parents isn't necessarily there now you might kind of like zoom in into you know him as a growing up in luo growing up in the north something i can't relate to but there are going to be certain similarities because at the end of the day, we share a country, you know, so there is a cultural history that comes with sharing a country. We share presidents, you know, so we all heard stories about certain, you know, uh, I guess musicians or certain, um, you know, cultural 
figures or public figures. So, you know, just even growing up Ugandan itself, the term Ugandan, you know, we've probably had similar experiences in school. People saying, oh, you're Ugandan. Does this mean that? Da, 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 da. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting actually speaking to you speaking to Ugandans um, and this is the most I think I have like spoken to Ugandan people for you know consecutive amount of days apart from when I'm in Uganda um, or when I'm with my family you know so it's really it's really 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 enriching like I, I actually mm. love it like it's so it's such a good feeling such so good do, feeling. and do you feel like now that you're like slightly older like you feel like you're it's easier for you to talk to them more or easier for you to bump into Ugandans more Oh yeah, 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 hundred percent. And like, even even when I see Ugandans, like I might hear the Ugandan speaking. You know, they could just be speaking English, and I clock that they've got a Ugandan accent, and immediately I might just you know say what's up to them in Uganda or something, or just say what's up to them. Um, like it happened to me actually. Like I was on the phone to my mum, and you know, speaking Uganda, and and this dude responded. And he's like, I was like, oh shit, you're Ugandan, okay. And we started talking and I was like, actually, you never know who's in the short or this bus that's Ugandan. And it felt much easier to answer your question. It felt much easier speaking to them because like you said, I I say I'm Ugandan with my chest now. Like I don't mm, kind of, I don't feel like- That's a big difference. Yeah, I don't, feel, I don't feel ashamed. Like I don't have that insecurity of like, oh, I don't speak Ugandan as well as my cousins. Oh, I haven't spent, 10 years or 20 plus years in Uganda I don't know who so and so is I don't know who the minister of this is I just say you know what I'm Ugandan and it's a gradual you know um uh journey it's a journey mm. where I'm gonna familiarize myself with this you know um I have a quiz at the end so you know about the quiz where I use that as an opportunity to in- improve my knowledge on you know Ugandan culture and Ugandan politics or Ugandan yeah. history you know so yeah, it's a, it's a journey, but it is it is a lot easier now because I'm older and I don't have that chip on my shoulder of like, oh, like I'm not Ugandan enough. I don't really I don't really care for that. Even yeah. if the, even if the, someone was to say that, and I just go, okay, whatever you say. But I feel I feel I am, and yeah. I know I'm gonna be even more Ugandan the older I get. You know. Yeah, and I think yeah. like big props to you because the fact that you're even. It literally the name is literally on the tin like proper Uganda podcast like you're actually going out here because you want to learn you want to talk about, about topics and it's a Ugandan podcast where it's a safe mm. space for Ugandans to people to come on and just talk about you know so many very different topics and I think yeah. that makes you more Ugandan than a lot mm. of people so mm. yeah big up yeah big up us for you know uh trying to connect with our Ugandan culture and uh so where where did you go to uni and what did you study? Uh, so I went to uni, uh, the University for the Creative Arts in Epsom, oh, yeah, so yeah, UCA, yeah, yeah. and yeah, I yeah. studied fashion journalism. And um, you know, it was an interesting course. You know, that's all I can say. It was it, it was definitely interesting. You can't, you can't say more. You can't say more than that. I mean, I look back and I'm like, I didn't really have to do that. I mean, I mm. could have just just done you know an ncj and just actually done like broadcast radio journalism because uh, for my a levels i studied media studies sociology and philosophy and those are like three heavy based essay writing subjects well more so philosophy and sociology and media studies you learn on the job and i was learning production and stuff like that anyway and then i came to uni because i love fashion anyway i just love it you realize you if you do or you don't like something when you actually spend time studying it you're like well maybe i don't like it that much maybe i just like mm. it as a hobby like mm. i just know if i was going to fashion i would just want to design my own clothing line or do something like that like i just yeah, yeah. the industry is just not for me the people so far i've interned at different fashion houses and i've just been like nah you lots are definitely not for me um mm. and also i just didn't have that that love for it at the same time because i feel like if you love something a lot yeah and at least you can put up with you know the people the negativity and all of that stuff so yeah i did that for three years graduated and then you know it was you know interning at the same time and then i couldn't find any jobs so i just took a job as an office manager and just you know it was just getting money anyway as a graduate and i just worked and it was for a litigation pr firm and I just worked on like branding, marketing and that side during there. And I did that for nearly two years. 
um, then I just felt that love for journalism again. But then I was like, I don't have experience in actual, well, I did because of writing essays and articles and news and stuff like that. But then I was like, I need first-hand experience in news organisations. Mm. So that's when I started interning at different, you know, news organisations and stuff. And then eventually, you know, I just started working my way up there. Dope. Dope, dope. I, I was going to ask you about um, the fashion houses that you worked at, but I don't know if you'd want to talk about your experience working there, because I know that can be... I mean, intense. not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, I could, but... You don't have to. Well, oh, actually, to be fair, to be fair, there were like small startups, and some of them mm-hmm. were. I mean, Graduate Fashion Week was fun. Graduate okay. Fashion Week. Fashion Week is always mm-hmm. fun. I mean, you learn mm-hmm. so much. But it's literally, you know, if you've watched the movie The Devil Wears Prada, where you are getting the tease and chasing and running after people. But if you're junior, that, that's the stuff people expect you to do. Mm-hmm. So if you're not going to sit down and do that, well, they're like, well, tough. And it's a very bitchy industry. Like, people want what you have and they're coming for the the neck if you're not on top of things Mm. so and I'm just more like I don't know I like reading I'm more insightful I just like (laughs) yeah like there's so much Mm. steps I just want to learn more but if it's just like that I, I just get bored so okay well that's when I was it looks like, like fashion is not for me. I need to study mm. and stuff as a, as a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It looks like the internet is starting to move a bit paganistic. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that as a sign that we should um, move on to the quiz. The quiz. This is this is one of my favorite parts. That's okay. Really cool. It gets a bit. I'm scared it gets a bit of this quiz. I'm not gonna lie. I saw the questions. I was like, "Why would he do me like this?" You know what? You know what? You know what? Those, those. I actually haven't sent you those questions. Those aren't the questions. Oh, so, no, those, they're not. Yeah, those were just gonna be. Those were just gonna be um, topics like of discussion. But actually, the more when I start talking to people, especially when I'm talking to you, I just go actually it's more interesting to talk about what you're talking about, what you want to talk about. As opposed to me going, what do you like about Uganda? What's your favorite part about Uganda? Like you end up telling me that anyway through your discuss, um, just your 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 chat about your background. So um, so yeah, these questions you definitely should be afraid of yeah. because yeah, these are these are sticky. Um, all right. This, so this is a set up. You've actually set me up. <laughs> I'm not setting you up. I promise you, I'm not setting you up. And I wouldn't know these answers as well if I didn't um if I didn't write the, the question. So, okay. all right, so this is the proper Ugandan quiz with Natasha Evita. Okay, question one. What is the name of Uganda's famous university? I thought oh, you'd be good at this. Y- yes. Is that right? Yes, ma- ma- yes, yes, that's correct, that's correct. Now, when I wrote this, I didn't know you spent time in Uganda, so I was asking some questions, thinking, "Oh, she won't know this. Like, she won't know this." But yeah, I think you're you're going to be good at this. Okay, correct. Question two: What's the name of you, the Ugandan German singer who sang the song "Mambo Number no. 5? Oh, oh. I don't know. I can't remember his name. He died though, didn't he? Ah, uh, we could find out. I hope he didn't. He would have been no, a good guess. No, I don't know. Um, so old. That's so old. No, I don't know. I can't remember his name. And let me make sure that he is actually German. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, I think I think you're right. He probably is. I think he is dead. No, let's see. Are they talking? They're talking in past tense here. That is a throwback question. I can't even believe you asked me that. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, but the, no, Lubaga. Is that his name? Wait. Say, say it again. Oh, don't tell me you. you, you is it Lubaga a... or something? Yes. yes. He's still alive. Yeah. No. No. It just came He's to bigger. my brain. It just came. Yeah. He's, He's still beggar. alive, it's but his name is Lubaga. 
Rebecca. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're Rebecca, right. that because put that that. Rebecca, Lou Beggar was his name, but obviously it was Lou Beggar. But now nah, he's still he's still alive, man. Let's not kill the dude before you there know you his time. No, no, he's still about. He's still about. But according to top it in like Google. thinking about it, I was like. Lou Berger. Nah, yeah. Lube, yeah. Lube, yeah. Lube, Lube. So wow, sorry, Lou Berger, if you're listening to this. Forgive us. Forgive us, Lou Berger, Mr. Berger. Um, we beg for your forgiveness, Lou Berger. Um, okay, number three. Can you still hear me? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, all right, because you're just frozen a bit, but as long as you can hear me, that's, that's all that matters. All right, name the Ugandan actress who acts alongside yeah, Ugandan you. Danya Kaluuya in Black Panther. I repeat, name the Ugandan actress who acts alongside Ugandan Danya Kaluuya, your fellow Musoga in Black Panther. Oh my gosh. I don't know. That one, I've just, I know it's probably so vague, but I actually don't know her name. But you is seen it the, the bald headed lady? Yes. Yeah, I've seen yes. it more yes. than once. It's the bald headed lady, isn't it? Yeah, you better not be doing some Googles. I see you got them. No, Googles. I'm not. I'm literally not. not. I'm not. It's the bald lady. It's the bald. It's the bald. Well, unfortunately, the bald lady is not a name. Her name is Florence Kasumba. It's from the north. Uh, oh, Florence. No, Kasumba doesn't sound like a northern name. No, I wouldn't have but, known that. Yeah, unless that could be her husband's name. But um, Florence Kasumba, yeah. But So big up her. If she can come on this podcast, I would love it. Um, okay, so question yeah, no, four. she's doing bits. And she's, she's beautiful, doing, like, honestly. Yeah. She speaks German as well. So she's, uh, she's German as well. She does some work in Germany. Um, okay, question four. All right. Name one Ugandan news outlet. Print media. This again, uh, your media. This is your thing. This is you lived in Uganda. You done media. Book a day. <laughs> 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 yes. I was going to say the Lucas yes. show, the Ugandan one. I was actually going to say uh, the monitor, daily monitor. But I was yeah, like, no, let me just say book a day. Bruh. Okay, you went for the you went for the Buganda one. That's dope. Okay, so I would yeah. accept obviously Bukhead Day. Anyone who's following along, I would accept New Vision. I would accept Daily Monitor. I would also accept Red Pepper. And if you know any other ones hey. that I don't know, you know, yeah. So big up those news outlets. Um. Okay, the final question. Oh, this one. Banange ogena kava. Or Jack Carver for this one, all right? You're going to cry for this one. <laughs> oh, so, no, question stop it. five. I'm scared. Don't be scared, but just be ready to shed some tears. Finish the lyric from the Ugandan National Anthem. Finish this lyric from the Ugandan National Anthem. Oh, Uganda, may God okay. uphold thee. We lay our future in your in thy hands. Yes, you got it. Thy, your hands. I should have made it a lot e- harder for you, but I decided, let me make it easy. Oh, you got, wanna... let's sing it. Oh, you let's got, sing it. God, 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 we, we lay our future our in, in thy hands. Hand. <laughs> That's all I know. Continue, continue, continue. Go on. I don't know after That's that. It. My brain just oh, goes I blank. I thought going to sing. I thought we were going to sing the rest Oh, wait. Of it. Uganda, may God hold the relay of your in the hands. No, that's it. My brain after that goes blank. Same. That's, I'm, I'm ashamed. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ugandan God. Imagine sorry. in primary school, we used to sing that day in, day out, and I can't even yeah. remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We used to. But I, I, I spoke to John Rothermack, one of the past guests, and I said, I propose that we change the national anthem to Radio and Weezo Nyenda Maso. Oh yeah, you know that that's song? a good one. That's a good, a good one. one isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's a it's good one. Perfect. It is perfect for that. So we should start a petition and get that changed. You know, at least it's a new one. You know, we honor radio, RIP radio. You know, who unfortunately passed away after getting involved in a 
fight in a bar. He got um, yeah, he, he got killed by a by by a security guard. Yeah, he's so talented that guy, man. So so talented. Um, but yeah, so okay, so you also saw in the email that we get a fact of the week. Did you manage? I know it's very last minute. Did you manage to get a fact of the week? No. No worries. I've got one. Um, apparently, according to nationfacts.net, uh, about one quarter of Uganda's surface is made up of lakes and rivers. Apparently. Did you know that? Or do you know? No. <laughs> no, I care. What you mean? I care. I care. Of course, I care. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right. Okay. Word of the day. Did you get word of the day? You gotta give us the Lusoga word of the day at least. Even if um, it's like good morning or even if it's Codeo. There you go. Oh. Ooh, Codeo. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. It's like hello, um, um how are you kind of thing. And then you respond Tulio. Ooh, Tulio. That's a bit like um Luganda as well. Tulio. Yeah. Tulio. You see what I'm saying when they change yeah. they change they take out the nouns and extend it yeah you just mm. say like Cordeo or something Cordeo, mm-hmm. Tulio. okay word of the day for me in luganda is a nyumba and i chose this a nyumba because of your podcast talks with tash because you want to encourage people to take up space and for me i translate that to take up space in this house this world this the whole house should be your house you should be able to take the same way you take up space at home in your house you take up space wherever you go so yeah in nyumba is luganda for house okay so all right let's wrap this up i've really enjoyed speaking to natasha natasha vita um i can't wait to be on your podcast i really want to like get an opportunity to be interviewed hey. by you so i'm really looking forward to that and um yeah so are you still there? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm yeah, here. So, but I'm like, okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. Before before we go, remind people where they can get you in the social media. Okay, guys, stay tuned. Natasha Ravita on Instagram. Tasha Ravita on Twitter. Talks with Tash Pod is dropping real soon. Talks with Tash Pod on Instagram and Talks with Tash Pod on Twitter. Talks with Tash Pod on Facebook and the YouTube Talks with Tash Pod. I don't know why I did that. No, I, I like it. it. I like it. It gives me, <laughs> it's it gives, it gives me inspired to do. by what you did earlier. You're trying to do, no, 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 don't cut. Listen, I'm cutting other people. Don't be cutting the cat. Um, all right. So, okay. My my podcast is, uh, oh, or rather my Instagram and social media. Don't worry, Kobe. You can take, take, still. My social media is King, King underscore Kalunji on Instagram, Kalunji underscore on Twitter, and Proper Podcast on Twitter and Instagram for this um, podcast. And Proper is spelled P R O P A podcast, the usual way. And of course, you can find this full podcast if you just search the Proper Ugandan podcast on YouTube. And remember as well to check out kalunji.co.uk to get access to. My music, my debut album, Katugende, that's available to download on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Music, rap, 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 rap. It's available everywhere, all the streaming sites. So if you happen to be in parts of the world where you don't have access to that, it's there. So just check out kalunji.co.uk, K-A-L-U-N-G-I.co.uk, and you'll be able to get access to that debut album, Katugende, as well as my clothing line, Kalunjem. And I just want to finish by reminding people that my debut play, Asata Taught Me, was a play that I wrote inspired by the FBI's Most Wanted Woman, um, Asata Shakur, who uh, was sentenced to life imprisonment for a crime that she is confident she did not commit. And she ended up escaping and ending up in Cuba, where she's been living for the past 30 plus years. Okay, so check out this play where I imagine a friendship between Asata, Asata Shakur, aka Tupac Shakur's godmother. I imagine a friendship between her and a Cuban male who wants to live the American dream. So check that out. It's available on Amazon. You can get it on your Kindle or you can just get the hard copy. It looks so good and it reads so well, especially in the times that we're in right now. So, uh, Tasha, again, is it? So, 
nange ndoza kantani kugenda my translation to that is natasha is gone so i should also start going as well um katumulinda take ko headphones is it yeah are you know yeah 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 Kale, kale, kale. Um, those are Katugende, not to plug my album, but Katugende. Um, Kubana Connection, Kati, the connection is moving mad. So, but yeah, so thank you again, Natasha, for taking the time out to speak to me and uh, speak to you soon. No worries. All right, brilliant. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's